This will be our final installment in the series on the Lord's Supper. And I trust you've been able to appreciate more the this ordinance. Amen. <coughs> this is something we do. This isn't something you just think, it's something you do. And at this table, your thoughts and your actions are joined together in a productive way. The environment in which the Lord's Supper was instituted will be our focus. This covers John 13, 1 through the conclusion of the 17th chapter. That's 23 to 24% of the total Gospel of John was devoted to a few hours of time. Actually, it's the most extensive coverage of a period of time, in the, I believe, in the Scripture. Just a few hours, and all of its weighty, weighty yeah. things. There's nothing that's a shallow. Some of Jesus' deepest teachings were at this time. Amen. Some of his other teachings are, I hesitate to say shallow, but they were comparatively shallow to what he said at this time. The multitudes never did hear anything like this. In fact, that the multitudes were never really given any substantive teaching by Jesus. They had to be familiar with the Word of God. Understand? There's no understand this, but this is true, and you just put it to the test. Anything that was Jesus delivered to the multitudes was really kind of on the surface. Now, if anyone was interested in further, they he would take it further. But very few people were. Very few people actually inquired into what Jesus said, except for his disciples. <clears throat> now the sobriety of this ordinance is seen in the environment in which it was instituted. It was not an emotional environment. Well, it was emotional. It was a primary, primarily an emotional environment. It wasn't everybody crying and anything like that. It was a, it was a profound period of time now God always, this way God is, God when he's going to institute something significant, he, he arranges for an environment where like giddy-headedness, froth, frivolity, humorous, <laughs> all of that's kicked out. Now I demonstrated this at like Sinai. Hey, there was no casual conversations going on at Sinai. There was no little joke telling sessions over here. We're talking about the neighbors over here, not in Sinai. The environment was, boy, he had your attention. Nobody was not paying attention. That's how Sinai kicked off. It was of such a nature it scared everybody. They had every right to be scared. And when at Pentecost was fully come, look at the kind of environment that was. It was preceded by 10 days of prayer. The disciples all together praying with one accord. Mm -hmm. And they weren't taking prayer requests. Yeah. <laughs> Not there in those 10 days. Mm -hmm. Don't forget Mary. Don't forget John. Don't forget Ralph. I mean, they weren't, that's not the kind of praying they were doing. Yeah. They were praying to, they had in mind thy kingdom come, and when the comfort is going to come, and you receive power. That's the kind of day you praying with that sort of thing in mind. What was an environment? When the day of Pentecost is fully come, when God is going to do what he promised, they were all together with one accord in one place. Amen. The environment. The environment was important. Now let's look at the... Uh, the immediate setting, the environment. John begins there in verse 1, he says, that Before the feast of the Passover, 
when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Jesus knew that his hour was come. Amen. That he should depart out of this world unto the Father. That's a, that's a kind of a, that's a kind of thing Jesus was thinking about. Mm -hmm. He was you were born to live. Jesus was born to die. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now about thirty three and a half, some about roughly calculated about thirty three and a half years had passed. And now the reason he came into the world now it's it's here. Yeah. He doesn't say that he should die, although that was involved, but that he should depart. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Not temporarily, while his body was in the tomb, he talked about depart and go back to the Father. So he looked at his death in like one grand composite view, die, buried, raised, ascended, that was all under the general heading of died. And then when that, once he died, the world never saw him again. Right. Never appeared to anybody else in the body. That was it. So he knew this is the environment he had. He knew he was going to depart. So now you talk different when you know you're going to depart. You might be with someone. You might visit someone. You stay with them for a few days. But when you, when you get ready to leave, you, you talk different. Yeah, that's right. Talk different then. But that wasn't all. He, there was a, a prevailing love. He was, he was going to undergo the worst experiences, not only that he underwent, but anyone ever underwent. He was going to undergo these experiences. But he wasn't really thinking only of himself. He, he said, having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. So right up to the end, he's thinking about his disciples. <laughs> Well, what do you think he's thinking about now that he's come back and he's in heaven? Yeah. What do you think he's thinking about? Yeah. He loved him while he was here. When he was undergoing what he came to do, he loved his own his environment. He said he was loving his disciples when he talked to them. These were expressions of love that he gave them when he talked to them. And there was a, the old covenant was ending before he commenced this dialogue about the, the concluded with the Lord's table, here's what it says in John 13, 2. And supper being ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. So the old covenant, Passover, ended yeah. Amen. that night. That's right. I'm sorry the preachers that say we got to observe the Passover now. They're liars. They're not telling the truth. It ended. That's right. Jesus didn't institute the Lord's Supper during the Passover feast. Amen. It was ended. Yes. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Supper being ended. So now there's a new era. That's right. Entering in, the disciples didn't know about it at the time, but they came into a knowledge of it. And the battle was set in array yeah. at this time. Verses 2 and 3 of John 13 says, The devil, having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, mm -hmm. you think you have children you're ashamed of? Yeah. What about Simon, mm -hmm. Judas's father? You ever thought about that? Simon's son. Devil put it into his heart to betray him. <laughs> that, that was that was present at this table. Judas was there. That's right. And he was there while this is going on. Mm -hmm. At this holy moment, Satan put something in Ju Judas's heart during that moment. Yeah, that's right. Mm. <laughs> so at the highest moment. When Jesus knows that he's going to depart, he knows he's going back to the Father, he loves his own. At that moment, Judas's heart was wide open for the devil to come in. Right. Hmm? During that moment. So the battle set in array. And then the verse continues, John 13, 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, even Judas, 
And he was come from God and went to God. See, with that in mind, he's going to proceed. With that in mind. He's not going to test the water and see what the disciples might like to hear. What might is more likely to be received. That's not what he's thinking about. Not at this night. First thing he does, he, he shines a light on the necessity for cleansing. Supper's ended. Satan's, Satan's entered Judas's heart, so Judas has made up his mind now what he's going to do. He's going to go betray Jesus and tell people, tell Jesus' enemies where he's going to be so they can arrest him. Yeah. He rises up from the supper, lays aside his garments, his outer garment, took a towel, wrapped it around himself, and commences to wash the disciples' feet. This is now the environment yeah. in which the Lord's table is going to be instituted. One by one, he's making his way around the disciples. I don't know whether Judas at the front end, the back end, or in the middle. I don't know where Judas, where Peter was at when he washed his feet. He even washed Judas's feet. Yeah. <laughs> Judas hadn't left yet. So he's making his way around. He comes to Peter, and Peter says, "You're out." Up, <laughs> I'm not worthy of this. You're not going to wash my feet. I'm humiliated by the fact. I'm humbled by the fact that you're down there and I'm sitting up. I might, this situation doesn't uh, agree with me. I don't. I don't think this is right. You'll never wash my feet. Jesus says, uh, "Well, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me." Yeah. I won't pay attention to you, yeah. and you won't walk with me, and you won't have anything to do with me if I don't wash your feet. Mm -hmm. Get this straight in your mind, Peter. Yeah. I'm not your buddy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not here to help you get through life. Yeah. Get this straight in your mind, Peter. If I don't wash you, you've got no association with me. Amen. Oh, I tell you, that revolutionized people's life if they saw that. Yeah. Let's put it right down, put the fodder right down where the people can eat it. If you don't let Jesus forgive you, Jesus will not have anything to do with you. Amen. And he'll not let you have anything to do with him. Amen. Well, you remember the account, Peter said, oh, Lord, he says, Let's not stop with the feet. Wash my hands and my head also. Oh, he says, no, Peter, we don't need. This is not a thorough washing. This is just a, this is cleansing up what's touched the earth. Yes, amen. I've already washed you. You're already clean through my word. So you just need to, we used to call it when I was a boy, a spit bath. Yeah. You just need to have your feet washed. The part of you that's touching the earth, that's, do you really know that you've been you contaminated just by being in the world? Yes, yeah. Just being here. Yeah. There's a contamination that takes place. You go to work, you get contaminated. Yeah. You go to the store, you get contaminated. Some people go visit their relatives, they get contaminated. Yeah, amen. That's got to be cleansed. Amen. That, that's got to be cleansed. Amen. So he said... Uh, he just be washed. Only needs to have his feet washed. That's all I've. And if you don't get this, uh, my, might call it minor filth. If you don't get this off of you, you can't. You can't have anything to do with me. See, some people are used to having spiritually dirty feet. Yeah. They, they're just used to it. They'll tell you, "I'm unworthy. I don't deserve it." And I, they all tell, always talking like this. You got to be cleansed from that. Now, let me remind you now, if you sense this cleansing, now you can perceive in your spirit, you can perceive, you know, I find out I'm not affected by this communication I had. It was, un, it was just in the duties of life, but I, I don't feel defiled. Mm -hmm. Then you've been washed. Amen. Then Jesus has washed your feet. 
That's what's happening. That's why you don't feel contaminated. That's why you got over some of the associations you'd rather not have, but there they were. You were kind of defied by You heard stuff you didn't want to hear. You saw stuff you didn't want to see. But now, lo and behold, this isn't dominating you anymore. Amen. What's happened? You've had your feet washed. That environment was at the Lord's table, and you can remember, you can remember that sort of thing here. I'm clean. Then the environment of this table, verse 11, John 13 says, he knew while he's washing the people's feet, while he's washing, he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, you're not all clean. Yeah. Let me make this clear, yeah. you 12. You're not all clean, because he said, he just washes clean every whit, see? Yeah. Uh -huh. but, he gets, but not every, but not all 12 of you are clean. Well, it may be at this table, not everyone that's there is clean. Very likely. Jesus knows who it is. Amen. It's our business, but he knows. He knows that there's some people that it looks like he washed them. Like he washed Judah's feet. But he wasn't. He wasn't clean. So at this table... You've got to believe this now. Jesus knows who's serious and who's not. Yes. Amen. Your main work is to find out, are you serious? Amen. <laughs> That's, That's right. You don't have to worry about the rest. He knows. He knows who's not clean. He knows. Sometimes when people sin so bad outwardly, you can kind of, they reveal they're not clean. See, when people fall into sin, it's because they're not clean. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's what the trouble is. They're not clean. They haven't been washed. When they had these un, these associations, lawful associations, but contaminating associations, they didn't take care of that. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's a foot sins. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> See? that's what that is. If you sit with Jesus, he'll wash your feet. We're not talking about things that had to be confessed that you did intentionally. We're not talking about that. We're talking about defilement that happens just in the normal course of life, but it's still you got to have it clean. Yeah, that was the environment in which this table was instituted, and he, know, uh, he knew who, the, who wasn't being cleansed by this. So you've got you've to leave that to, with him. And he, uh, he asked his disciples, when he got through, he said, um, Know ye what I have done unto you? you? If you picked up on it, what I did? You call me Lord and Master, and you're doing the right thing when you do that. So I am. I am your Lord and Master. But I've given you an example here that you should do as I have done unto you. You should wash one another's feet. <laughs> you should help each other get over the contamination that comes in the normal routines of life. Amen. Yeah. That's why we don't like talk among the brethren that has to do with worldly involvements while we're in assembly. We're not saying it's wrong to talk about those things. We're saying it's wrong to talk about them here. Because we're trying to get over the defilements those associations caused. Yes, right. So we like to be able to get over our jobs when we get here. Amen. Get over the contact with our relatives we had when they get here. Get over the defiling things we found on, in school and by neighbors and <laughs> so we want to be cleansed from the effects of those things and because they tend to dull yeah. your spiritual senses and pretty soon because of the frailty of the human constitution pretty soon you get thinking about these little things that of themselves don't look too big and pretty soon whoa why they moved in they move in your heart and pretty soon you got seven more of these thoughts yeah. <laughs> that are worse than the original one you had. 
Now, I'm talking about the environment, now the Lord's table. It's the environment of cleansing. At this table, he said, uh, after he washed their feet, he says, I, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. Looks like I chose 12, but only really 11 of you are really chosen. That the scripture might be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me right here at this table, he's lifted up his heel against me. He's already been negotiating here. I tell you before it come, that when it's come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. He that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. I'm telling you this ahead of time. I'm telling you things ahead of time. So later on, when this institution is observed, when this supper is observed, you can kind of pick up. Yes, I see it now. Everybody I've been involved with that is a professed Christian really, really isn't. I kind of picked up on it. Sometimes I'd be disappointed. Why did they do that? Why did they do the other? Why did they conduct themselves the way they did? I've told you these things ahead of time to let you know I know who these people are. And maybe in due time you'll find out who they are too, but I'm telling you this so you know I'm the one. That if you find out that the people are not faithful people, don't you know I knew it before you did? Amen. In fact, that's the only reason you know about it is because you was with me. That's the environment. Now, this was a troubling thing to Jesus, to know that his betrayer was sitting at the table. This was a troubling thing to Jesus. So this is the environment on the Lord's table. Let's all these things take place at that time. John 13, 21 says, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit. Jesus, who knew all things, who knew why he came into the world, who knew he was about to depart and be with the Father, he knew this. He was troubled in spirit. That's what it says. So, the fact that you have a firm grasp on reality doesn't mean you won't be troubled right. about certain things. Yeah. They'll trouble your spirit. He is troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily I say unto you, One of you shall betray me. Now here's something Jesus knew was going to happen. It's something God ordained to happen. Yeah. And it still troubled him. See, that means knowing the will of God and being convinced that all things are of God doesn't mean you just pass over stuff right. that are, isn't right. It doesn't mean that. So if you find yourself unable to just like blot out of your mind that the way things are, sometimes a person that doesn't know the Lord can be sitting right there during the most sanctified moment the church has you may think to yourself, I wish this didn't have to be this way. I wish it wouldn't happen. I don't, we're not saying we know it's happening. That's not what we're saying, what I'm saying here. But I'm saying you've got to learn to leave that kind of stuff up to the Lord. Amen. Amen. He knows he's troubled. If you ever find out about Judas, you'll be troubled too. Amen. You ever find out about someone that betrayed the name of the Lord? We've had a couple of people that have defected. We aren't happy about it. We really aren't. It's very troubling to us that the thing happened. But it did, and I'm not going backward because they did. Amen. In fact, I'm going to do my very best to forget them. You notice that the apostles never talked about Judas after Pentecost? You probably picked up on that, huh? <laughs> they talked about Herod, and they talked about Pilate. Not about Jesus. Not only that, but he said, I'm going to let you know who this is. You're going to have to be alert. 
I'm going to dip some of the bread in this sop, or we do something like a gravy, we'd call it. Whoever I give it to, that's who's going to betray me. So he just looked like a regular routine. You know, he dips it, he hands it to Judas. Then he says to Judas, I gather kind of a low tone, what thou doest, do quickly. Get to it, Judas. Go meet your friends, the Sanhedrin. But no man knew why Jesus said this to him. This is the environment of the Lord's table. Jesus is doing something. Nobody really knows what he's doing, but he's doing something here that's critical to his death. Some of them thought Judas, well, Judas, he's a treasurer, you know. He has the bag, treasury bag. He probably, uh, Jesus probably told him to, maybe we had some more need for the feast. Need to buy some more bread or something. Or maybe he went out to give something to the poor. See, they thought graciously, see. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> thought graciously. But Jesus was setting up things for his own death. Yeah. And Judas, uh, having received this sop, he immediately went out, and then all oh, this telling sentence, it says, it was night. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I guess it was more kind of more than natural night. Yeah, that's right. This is the hour of the power of darkness. Yeah, yes. This is a period of time in which God had allowed Satan a little more leeway than he normally had. Uh -huh. Otherwise, Jesus never would have been taken and slain. This is the environment now in which Jesus, see, he kept his wits. If this is something you had to do, you wouldn't be able to keep your wits. You're, you're being shown a Savior here who's not distracted yes. by the worst of circumstances. They may distract you. They don't distract Jesus. Amen. We know this because of this event here. It didn't stop him from loving his disciples. It didn't stop him from thinking about it, departing, going to be with the Lord. It was troubling to him, but it didn't deter him yeah. Amen. from what he was about to do. And he got to thinking about and talking about his own, uh, about his own glory. Judas leaves. As soon as he walks out and the door is closed, Jesus says, John 13, 31, Now is the Son of Man glorified. <laughs> You'll be able to see more of me now that the defector is absent. Yeah. If God be glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. It's a lot of glory. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in a way, even though Judas went to betray Jesus, Jesus was glad to see him go. Now I can talk a little more freely now. Yeah. Now that the uh, traitor yeah. has left, I can open things up a little more. You know, some churches, they can't really get butts from God because there's too many traitors there. There's too many betrayers there. There's too many def defactors there. So not much can really be made known when they're present. This is the way God is now. This is the way Jesus is. You know it from this account here. He launches into all these marvelous things that happen after Judas has left. At John 13, 33, he said, Little children, yet a little while am I with you. He said, I'm not going to be with you much longer. Ye shall seek me, and I, as I said to the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, since you can't go where I'm going, you're not going to go down in the grave. You're not going to go up on the cross with me now. You're not going to go down into the grave with me now. So I'm going to tell you what you need to do. A new commandment I'm going to give you now. This is surrounding the Lord's table. New commandment I give unto you, John 13, 33 through 36, that ye love one another as I have loved you. By this, this is now he's getting ready to institute the Lord's Supper. <laughs> By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one for another. 
Peter, he can't uh, figure this out because this wasn't the first Passover they'd observed. This is probably the third one they'd observed. Whither goest thou? Where, where are you going? Mm -hmm. he'd been, now, he'd been talking about the last few weeks to him. Mm -hmm. He'd been talking about his imminent death. He'd be turned over to the chief priests and all that. They were going to crucify him. And the third day, he'd rise again. He'd been concentrating on this to the disciples. They didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't pick up anything about his death. Well, there's still people like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They can't pick up on this dying part yeah, that's right. yeah. of following Christ. Yeah. They, <laughs> they like to think about living and joy and wealth and health and being the head, not the tail. And they like to think about that, but they can't think about dying. Yeah. Well, Peter had the same view. And Jesus said, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now <clears throat> but thou shalt follow me yeah. afterwards you're gonna I'm dying for you now Peter but you're gonna die for me yeah, that's right. before this thing is over I laid my life down for you but you're gonna lay down your life for me after I've done that Do I ask, have you laid your life down for Christ, or are you still trying to live like a convenient, you know? I mean, you're willing to serve the Lord Jesus some, but you're not willing yet to die for him. Well, let's say, but you are willing now. You, you, you're willing to pay the price, because you don't have to pay the price. Yeah, that's right. You can't live until you die yeah, amen. with Christ. Now, if you're willing to do this, this proves that Jesus has completed what he said he was going to do. Amen. He laid down his life, he took it up again, he departed, went back to the Father, and the fact that you're willing to die proves that. Amen. That proves that to you. <clears throat> Peter answered him, Lord, he says, why can't I follow you now? He means this now, he says, I'll lay down my life for thy sake. Why can't I? Why can't I go with you now? You'll notice that nobody persecuted the disciples before Jesus' death. Yeah. Uh -huh. you know, I know you picked up on this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Nobody did. Nobody persecuted the disciples while they were with Jesus. Nobody laid a hand on them. They, they, they didn't even criticize them. They just asked them, well, "How come? How come you don't wash your hands ceremoniously like the rest of us do?" They, they didn't persecute them. That's, he wasn't going to die yet. <laughs> but Jesus, he reveals something to Peter. He'll reveal something to you too at this table. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need to know. He said, uh, you will lay down your life for my sake. Will thou lay down that life for my sake? Will you do it? You telling the truth, Peter, when you say this? Well, I'm telling you that tonight... Tonight, for the cock crows three times, you'll deny me three times. Hmm? Now, we used to have a cock rooster here in our back uh, yard here. He about drove us crazy. He'd crow like 80 times. Well, I counted him one night. About 80 times during the night. So three times, that's nothing. For a cock crow, that's nothing. Three times. But before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me three times. And Peter, he emphatically said he wouldn't do it, but he did. Sometimes the Lord can reveal things to you about yourself that you don't imagine. You don't imagine you'd be in that kind of situation. Yeah. I'm showing the environment now, the Lord's table. Let's proceed on. He advances now in the 15th chapter. Well, he elaborates on him leaving. He says, uh, 
If I go away, I'll come again. But I'm going, I'm actually going to prepare a place for you. So where I am, there you may be also. So he lets them know that too. At this table, it can clear up to you what Jesus is doing now. He prepared a place for, oh, he's not building a place, but that, that, that isn't what, it's not that the place you're going is not fully constructed yet. That, that's not what he means. Him being there is what gets there ready to receive you. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then he launches into talking about the vine and the branches. Mm -hmm. This is at the Lord's table now. This is before he institutes the Lord's Supper. It says, now I'm the vine, you're the branches. My father's the husbandman. Let me tell you something about this arrangement, he says. Whoever doesn't bear fruit, my father cuts them off from me. Mm -hmm. He says, whoever's in me yeah. and doesn't bear fruit, they're yeah. cut off. That's, right. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he said, whoever bears fruit, the Lord prunes it prunes them, cuts off the unproductive parts of that particular branch. He tells them this before he institutes the Lord's Supper. So you say to yourself, you know, I've felt that pruning, I've felt that pruning. There's some, there's some things I used to think and manners I used to have, and I, they, they can't, they're gone. What happened? The Father's pruned you. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened. Amen. And you become aware of that here at this table. You've been pruned. So why? So you can bring forth more fruit. My father was a productive gardener. I had the honor of doing the grunt work in the garden. We had corn. I had to sucker the corn. There's, a, there's, there's leaves down at the bottom of the stalk that bleed off the energy. They got to be cut off. I've seen people with gardens, you know, they have corn, and the corn's never been suckered, so they got little bitty ears. My father could do it with a hoe. Hoke, hoke, hoke. I couldn't do it. I cut the stalk down. I had to just do my hand. Now, the father suckers the vine. The vine has the same thing. There are, there are growths that are bleeders, little offshoots that don't, no grapes really grow on them. The father cuts those off, and then he takes the vine that is productive, and it that the branch is productive, and it has little bleeders, and the father cuts that off. So you see, you can examine yourself mm -hmm. during this time, and you'll find there's some things that have been taken away. I couldn't really tell you the when they were taken away, but I could. They've been taken away. I can kind of. That's the father's done that Amen. to you. Amen. So that was given at this at this table. Then he talked about loving one another at this table before he instituted the supper. He said, I'm commanding you to love one another just like I love you. Love one another. And then he told him, he said, now, I'm not calling you servants anymore. I'm going to call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. Yeah. <laughs> but a friend does Master tells him what he's doing. So the father told me what he's doing. And now I'm telling you what I'm doing. So have you seen all of a sudden you've kind of see what the father's doing? Maybe his purpose is kind of cleared up. Cleared up to you? Is that because you're like a good student? Is that why that happened? Jesus has cleared it up to you. Amen. That means you're a friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that means you're a friend. Jesus has been divulging to you what he's doing. See, so some of us took years. Didn't, we didn't see it. But we probably weren't at the table. That probably was what the problem was. At the table over which Jesus was presiding. And have you seen the difference between friends and servants? This doesn't mean you're not a servant. We're a servant of God, but a different kind of servant. It's a different kind of servant. Where the master divulges to the servant what he's doing. So that you can work intelligently. Amen. Work with God. 
And he talked to them about the Holy Spirit. He talked quite extensively to them about the Holy Spirit. He says, now when I leave, if I don't leave, the Comforter won't come. He called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Yeah, that's right. The one that kind of quieted you down. Made peace more prominent to you. But if I go, the Comforter will come. And he'll, uh, he'll stabilize you. So have you felt yourself becoming a little more stable? Maybe you made progress in this area. You progress a little bit. What's happened? The Comforter has come. Amen. That's what's happened. The Comforter has come. <clears throat> and he told him, ladies, that when the Comforter comes, he'll, con he'll convince or convict or convince the world of sin, mm -hmm. of righteousness, and of judgment. Mm -hmm. Of sin, because they don't believe on me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father. In other words, I'm the only righteous one. And of judgment, because the prince of the world is, is judged. Amen. <clears throat> well, now I ask you the question. Have you seen the sin of unbelief? You say, well, yes, I see that. The comforter has come. Amen. <laughs> That's what's happened. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that you're not righteous on your own, that you need the righteousness of God, mm -hmm. that Jesus is really the only one who's really right, inherently righteous? Have yeah. you seen that? Well, the Comforter has come. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And have you seen that Satan is judged? Satan, he's, he's, he's dying of a mortal bruise. His head is bruised by Jesus on the cross, and he's, he's diminishing. doesn't look like he's diminishing because he's flaying the air and angry, but he's diminishing. And have you seen that, that Satan's power is diminishing? You can get out of his clutches if you, if you pursue Christ. You'll, the doors are going to be open. You'll be able to walk out. Have you seen that? Have you seen that Satan is judged? The Comforter has come. That's why that's your confirmation. The Comforter has come. Have you seen, he said, when he's come, he'll guide you into the truth. All of a sudden, now you read it. You read the Bible for many years. You, all of a sudden, oh, things are opening up. Things are opening up. You begin to see things you didn't see before. What is it? The Comforter has come. Amen. That's what's happened. Mm -hmm. He's guiding you into the truth. All of a sudden, you're inclined to look here and look there, and you find these gems and these jewels. The Comforter yeah. has come. And he'll show you things to come. Has this happened to you? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, what's coming is clearer than what exists here in the world. Yeah. You yeah. see it's come. Oh, Judgment Day is coming. Ah, oh, the Lord Jesus is coming. I'm going to come meet, meet him in the air. It's, it's coming. And all of a sudden, that's cleared up to you. What is that? The Comforter has come. Amen. Amen. That's what it is. And then he prepared them for leaving. Jesus did. He said, I'm going to receive you unto myself when I come back. But I'm, you've got to be ready. I'm going to leave and you'll be sorrowful. You'll, you'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. <laughs> When you realize, I'm not in a grave, mm -hmm. <laughs> boy, you'll get boldness. Yes, amen. You'll have rejoicing. You'll be able to face the enemy. You'll be able to testify of me, bear witness to me. When you realize I'm not dead, I'm alive oh. and reigning forevermore. Mm -hmm. See? Do you realize that? I, mean, I don't mean do you believe that, you know, like a creed. Do you, have you, do you know Jesus is alive? And he's reigning and doing well. How is it that you do this? How is it you have this? Well, the comforter has come. Amen. That's how you have this. Jesus told his disciples, now, when I go back, no more Proverbs. <laughs> yeah. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to speak to you in Proverbs anymore. We're not going to have any more parables. <laughs> not when I go back. 
That's what he said now. Right. I'll not speak to you in parables. I'll talk plainly. Mm -hmm. I'll just come right out and tell you mm -hmm. the way things are. I'm not going to make any likenesses. So people that say that Jesus did this to make it simple for people. See, they're, they're simple people. I mean, I will acknowledge that. But they, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. Jesus doesn't teach in parables anymore. Amen. That's what he said. No more. Mm -hmm. No more likenesses. No more Proverbs. Solomon spoke in Proverbs when he was a king, but Jesus didn't. He spoke plain, and I'll show you the Father. Yeah. You'll know what I'm talking about. So do you begin to pick up on what Jesus is talking about? You read the Apostles' Doctrine, you can kind of pick up on it. It makes sense to you. you can... Why is that? It's because the Comforter has come. Amen. Now, brethren, what I've showed you here is all confirmed at this table. Mm -hmm. You enter into a remembrance of Christ and all the things he said were going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now you're able to see they've happened. Jesus died and rose again, and the confirmation that he's alive forevermore is that what he promised would happen is happening. Amen. And it's, uh, it's our job to see that you don't forget that. Because to the extent, to the extent that you remember Christ as the victor, and as the exalted one, and as the one who has pleased the Father, to the extent you remember that, to that extent, and only to that extent, you are a victor. Amen. If that ever becomes vague to you, you'll start losing. Mm -hmm. You'll drop. You'll lose ground. You'll be, it'll be easy to forget. And if you don't get out of that state... God will cut you off. Yeah. If you stay attached and let allow the life-giving sap to flow through you, instead of cutting you off, he'll prune you. Yes, that's right. So that you can bring forth more fruit. Because Jesus said, now herein is my Father glorified. This is John 15. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. How can I do that? Stay in Christ. How do I do that? This is one of the roles of the Lord's Supper. It is to assist you in abiding in Christ. That you at this table, God can make your mind fertile. So as you remember Jesus, you'll remember all kind of things related to him that will bolster your faith and your hope and your confidence in Christ. I commit these things to you. Amen. Brother Michael has the exhortation.